Hi everyone, welcome to this webinar about essential oils during pregnancy, specifically the first and the second trimester. And let me start off by just a few words about my own situation because I am pregnant right now and I'm a total science geek, but I also love to, you know, work with experiences that other people have. So I'm so excited about this topic and I, I really dove into it, but let me just say you're not going to hear any big don'ts during this webinar because to be honest i was really annoyed by all the fear mongering and false facts actually flowing around when it comes to essential oils during pregnancy i mean there's even in like very well-known books there's a lot of stuff in there that has no scientific data behind it and I'm, you know, you will find out how I'm, I'm big on trusting your own intuition and trusting your own body and just, you know, being smart about everything, not just using essential oils, but, you know, of course, nutrition and stuff like that. So anyway, what you will find are some scientific data, personal experiences, and I don't want to be one of those people that's on the soapbox and telling others, oh my gosh, that's so dangerous. Oh, don't do that. Oh, how horrible. Oh, how could you? You're putting yourself and your baby into danger and all the stuff that you don't actually even want to hear while you're pregnant. You want to have guidelines that support you, that help you feel good in your body, and as I said, not all the fear mongering. So let's get right into it. So in general, I can tell you there is almost no scientific data on essential oil usage during pregnancy, which of course makes a lot of sense because who would dare to tell a bunch of pregnant ladies, oh, you know, do this or swallow a whole bottle of this oil, whatever. It's unethical, of course. I mean, especially women during pregnancy, they're well protected in the scientific world. I mean, it's not easy to test or try out any medications on them. And this is, I mean, so smart. But of course, this also limits holistic approaches. So when you find studies, they're mostly only about diffusion, inhalation, aromatic usage, but there are some, but really not a lot. Most likely you find uh, animal or in vitro studies. So this means you have like cell cultures in a little dish and yeah, you put some whatever in there, be it like a single chemical compound or an essential oil itself, which... Mm, both like animal studies of course i mean if you study something on a rat it doesn't mean that it's the same for us as humans this is the same with cosmetics and other medications of course and the in vitro like the cell cultures in a dish well that's different than the living organism as well in many cases so just be aware of that whenever you come across a study being on pregnancy or whatever else just be mindful about this to distinguish what this would mean in the real world. The additional problem with all the studies or most of the studies that you will find is that we have no idea about the quality of the oils that were used. You know, it only says like lavender oil or peppermint oil. Now that doTERRA is having such a big scientific team, there are doTERRA studies out there. And you will even find some that say like, on guard the blend on guard was used so you know it's been a doTERRA oil so you can be sure about the quality but most likely you will find studies that tell you nothing about the quality of the oil and we have no idea if it was really good oil if it might have been a synthetic oil so we also have to be aware about that and oftentimes when you run across studies especially animal studies there's a crazy amount of oils being used. And there's like the first example. Um, the effect of essential oil from citrus or rantium in maternal reproductive outcome and fetal and anomaly frequency in rats. Uh, I think the study is from South America because in South America, the, uh, the bitter orange oil, and this is what they studied. Oh, it actually it says, I think it's from Brazil. Uh, bitter orange oil is something that uh, has been used 
for a long time for it's like an overall remedy something that can do everything basically so the researchers wanted to find out so but what it what if what happens to women during pregnancy when they take it so they studied it on pregnant rats and they had three groups um like each group got a different dosage like one got 125 the other 250 and the, the third one 500 micrograms per kilogram orally um and there's a typo um, excuse me uh on the days like the first till the 14th day of pregnancy and on day 20 and i think this is pretty shortly before a rat usually gives birth um the measurements were taken which unfortunately means the rats were killed and the measurements were uterine weight toxicology and abnorm abnormalities it's such a hard word for me to say of the fetus so they wanted to see if we feed those rats those amounts of bitter orange oil does it make any difference in their uterus does it hurt the fetus is there anything wrong with the liver after 14 days of taking it uh, daily. And the result was that the only group that had some you know, differences were actually the ones that received the 500 microgram per kilogram, and they had a statistically lower uterine weight. Usually what is actually considered as a marker for um, estrogen production, like over estrogen production is that the uterus gets heavier because the lining gets thicker blood flow gets stronger whatever so this is something that obviously some of the rats not all of them but some of the rats statistically they were saying oh all right so those that received the most bit of orange oil in their food had lower uterine weight but there were no abnormalities in the fetus and no toxicologies that was strange or seem to have bothered the whole body system now think about it like even just 125 micrograms per kilogram what would that mean for me as an adult person to take bitter orange oil like how many drops would that be and if i base my calculation on the fact that one drop of lavender oil weighs about 40 micrograms i mean you know bitter orange oil could be a little bit heavier i think it probably will be a little bit lighter but still let's base our calculation on this fact this would mean that me personally as about 50 kilogram person would need to take more than 150 drops of oil internally a day that is totally crazy that that's more definitely more than a 5 ml bottle a day to take internally but for rats, this is not even an issue, even pregnant rats. It's not even an issue for the fetus. So, but still, this is a study where I'm like, well, all right, it's quite interesting. It's actually, you know, seems like the orange oil is quite safe to even to take internally in high amounts. Would I do that? Of course not. I mean, who would? That, I mean, it, I think it's even hard to do. So, yeah, but that's one of the animal studies that you will find. And we mostly only have scientific knowledge about single components that are present as one of many components in oils. You know, every essential oil has many components. It's like a whole a universe of, of uh, components in there that do different stuff and that help each other out. So when you take a single compound out of an essential oil, oftentimes even like it's a synthetic compound that you work with in the study eh, it's quite hard to tell if this is what's really going on when you take the essential oil that just contains it uh, in your real life because as i said and i mean it's the same with the food you know we've all heard about if you take synthetic vitamin c and nothing else or vitamin e there's different kinds of vitamin e you need all of them for your body to really absorb it the rest is highly i mean there's a high risk of it being toxic in your body uh, after a certain dosage so all that kind of stuff and it's the same with essential oils like nature has a reason why essential oils contain a lot of compounds and not just one 
So think about that. And I found that especially physicians tend to think if I don't know a lot about it, I'd rather not recommend it. So this is a problem that we run into in the medical community right now. I know doTERRA is changing all of that as well, but you know, you won't get any, any real experiences or any real help from most physicians because they just haven't heard anything, they haven't studied it, they haven't worked with it, which is, in my opinion, the most important thing. So don't, don't get you know, distracted, don't um, just get unsure if your physician just tells you, oh, essential oils, oh no, probably, they are probably, or I think they're dangerous for you. I mean, have a good, good relationship, like a lot of trust in your physician, of course, if you can, I mean, this is what they're here for, right? but don't expect them to know a lot about it. So of course, now the question is, what's left as data to help us make decisions? I mean, if we can't really rely on studies, uh, if physicians don't know a lot about it, so who and how is there help for us? First of all, I would say real experiences count. And first and foremost, your own intuition. And studies can only be seen as a pretty rough guideline. So if you find a study that kind of interests you um, or, and that makes a lot of sense, and especially, you know, makes a lot of sense considering the, your own experiences, well, then, and you feel good about it, then it's probably the right thing for you. So I will show you some studies that make sense for me, that help me, that are some guidelines, like one Japanese study. Here, the physical and psychological effects of aromatherapy inhalation on pregnant women, a randomized controlled trial. So what this one doctor did, it's a gynecologist or an OBGYN, and he had pregnant women, all of them were uh, during week 28, and he brought them into a relaxed position while they were at his practice for some other stuff he looked at. And he told them basically to lie in a very comfortable chair for 10 minutes. And for the last five minutes of this time period, he had something diffused in the room. Interesting thing is the, the, the whole the study, the text only says that he used an essential oil high in linalool and linalool acetate. I'm guessing it was lavender. I'm pretty sure it was lavender, but it doesn't even say in the study. It just says what it was high in. So one, one group got the lavender oil and one group just some saline water. So basically water was salt, smelling nothing. This was the control group. So they took, oh, I, I'm another typer. Before and after the relaxation period um, and even during it, they took some measurements of how well the women felt, um, what their emotional state was, what their physical responses were, like blood pressure and heartbeat and stuff like that. And the result was that there was a pretty big high difference in the test group of, especially in feelings of anxiety, tension, and anger. So those feelings dropped significantly in the group that received the lavender oil diffusion for five minutes. The group that only got the water not so much. I mean, I guess some because they were just lying down in a chair and it was quiet. And you could tell that the parasympathetic nervous system, so the system in the body that regulates relaxation, uh, was also more active for the lavender group, which means the relaxation response was bigger, higher. Of course, we all know that, right? You smell lavender, you feel calm. Then there is another study, and again, it has something to do with inhalation and aromatic use, where they tried the effect of lemon inhalation aromatherapy on nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. A double-blinded, randomized, controlled clinical trial um, from Iran. What they did here was with women with morning sickness, which I can totally tell you is actually all day sickness, they gave them lemon essential oil or a placebo to inhale whenever they felt nauseous. So they told them basically, so whenever you're feeling unwell, you're feeling sick, take your bottle and just smell it. One got the lemon oil, the other one got something, I don't know, that didn't smell like anything. 
And the result, and of course this makes sense for us, was there was a significantly high difference. So this meant less nausea and vomiting in the test group, so the one that received the lemon oil, especially, and we have no idea why, the study even talks about this, on days two and four. And I think it was only a four-day study. So on the second and on the fourth day, the differences were the highest even. Why ever? So the conclusion is lemon essential oil can help you when you feel nauseous. And I can totally testify to that. To me, the citrus oils were oh, life-saving. I can only tell you that. This was especially interesting to me. It's, a, it's an animal study from, I guess, New Zealand or Australia. And it was effective rosmarinus officinalis essential oil supplementation on digestion, colostrum production of dairy use, and lamb mortality and growth. So sheep were fed. Um, oh, let me just check if I forget something to write down here. No, let me just tell a whole story. Sheep got fed rosemary essential oil. Uh, in their hay and their other feet. And they wanted to see, does it make any difference uh, when the lamb is born? Does it have any difference on uh, the milk production? Does it have any difference on how strong the lambs are? And the positive, there were actually only positive effects. So they found out that the group that received the rosemary oil in their feet, they ate more. So this means to me sheep like rosemary oil but they also had a higher amount of fat in their milk. So it was like more nourishing to the lambs and they had a significantly lower lamb mortality rate, 6% instead of 21% in the control group. So only 6% of the lamb, lambs of the ewes that um, got the rosemary oil died instead of 21% of the group that didn't receive anything of that. Isn't it interesting though that in almost every kind of literature you will find warnings about rosemary essential oil during pregnancy i guess and i mean i have to kind of go back a little bit uh you know that robert tisserand one of those guys who's big on essential oil and safety i mean he has written great books and i would even consider him to be kind of conservative with some stuff, but he's one of those who also likes to dig deep for studies and, and look for what's true, what's not true. And he found out some years ago, actually, already, that, you know, how almost every book tells you that rosemary essential oil will um, go make your blood pressure go up. And he was thinking, well, modern studies, actually, they don't support that theory. It even seems that sometimes the blood pressure drops with rosemary oil, and I mean, if you think about it, it's activating to your blood flow, so usually your blood vessels, of course, will get a little wider. So this is good for your blood pressure. And it's good for, you know, before you're doing any sports and stuff. And it's, I think, I find rosemary to be quite activating to my mind, to my mental presence, but it doesn't mean that my blood pressure will go up with it. So anyway, he looked at the original study, that the one everything started with, and found out that there was no rosemary essential oil in it. It was actually clary sage oil used on dogs. Uh, like they got it into the like intravenous on dogs, which made them pass out. And it was a high amount of uh, clary sage oil. And then when they came back kind of, the blood, the, their blood pressure went up, of course, which, sure, I mean, if you've been out, then your blood pressure goes uh, up for a little while to get you back on track, get you back on your feet. But the study, the one that all the books were writing about, didn't have any rosemary oil itself in it. So he was wondering what happened, and he actually never could find the original study that was cited in most books. So now he's like, well, somebody made a mistake, and all the other guys, all the other aromatherapists and others, authors that came after it, just took the information and never rechecked it. And I personally, my husband, when I was pregnant, oh, I don't know, I think it was first trimester, maybe early second trimester, uh, he had a cold, he had a cough, and 
Uh, he used rosemary oil on his chest and on his back and he let me put it on him. And I can tell you, I love the smell of rosemary. It was so fresh, it was so nice. I inhaled like the stuff that, that was still left on my hands. I inhaled it for hours. I really enjoyed it and I felt good about it. So it wasn't that my body was rejecting it or anything. It was more like, oh yeah, give me more of that. It's very nice for me. So that's why I'm like, you know, don't always believe what you read, right? For lambs, of course, we're not, we're no sheep, but we're also no rats that a lot of studies are based on. A rosemary oil is actually very good during pregnancy. I'm not saying drink a bottle of rosemary each and every day, but what I'm saying is don't freak out if you use a blend or anything that contains rosemary. And if you feel like rosemary would do anything good to you and your body's really longing for it, then there might be a reason for that. So my personal experiences. Now let's talk about what I did in the last few months. First of all, what's super important, and I knew that before, but <clears throat> I didn't use supplements because, specifically because I wanted to get pregnant. I knew this would be a nice side effect, but basically just to feel better. But before and during pregnancy, the Lifelong Vitality Pack or the Daily Nutrient Pack are so amazing, especially when it comes to folate consumption. And you know how you hear a lot about folic acid when you are pregnant and everybody tells you, oh, are you taking your folic acid and stuff like that? Well, the difference between folate and folic acid is that folic acid is the synthetic form of folate. Folate is what's um, in, oh my God, I think it's in beans, it's in asparagus, it's in citrus fruit. So it's a vital well, supplement. It's a vital part of our what we're eating each and every day. And the folic acid is the synthetic form that we just throw into our bodies and everybody tells us to take when we're pregnant. As always, if I can have the natural form, why would I go for the synthetic form, right? What's also important is, and the truth is, and I've one of my, I think it was during one of my craniosacral trainings that uh, we had a midwife in the group and she was talking about folic acid. And basically what she said was, you know, by the time most women have the first appointment with their doctors when they find out they're pregnant, it's actually too late to take the folic acid because you should actually take it at least four weeks before you conceive a child to have the lowest risk of defects in the development of the baby because you take them especially for um, the, there I'm sure there's a good English word for it, but basically for the spine of the baby and for the development of the nervous system. Um, so this is especially important for that, but for a lot of other things, but this is mostly why doctors tell you to take it so the spine um, is proper properly developed during pregnancy, but you, this happens in the very, very first weeks of pregnancy, oftentimes before you even know you're pregnant. So it doesn't make any sense to wait for your doctor's appointment oftentimes, because I've had mine, I think at week, I was nine weeks or 10 weeks pregnant already when I saw my doctor for the first time. And she told me right away when I called her, oh, you know, it, there's no need of seeing me any earlier than that. Because I mean, there's nothing a doctor can do if something went wrong. And if everything is fine, you will go from there. But before that, I mean, there's no real medical intervention that could help you. So, of course, I was taking my lifelong mortality before that just to, you know, make me feel good. And I was taking it before I saw my doctor. And then I told, you know, I'm already taking something with full. And he was like, oh, perfect, then you're fine. And the recommendations are that you take 400 to 550 micrograms per day of folate especially while you're pregnant and the microplex V and Z, this is like the vitamin and mineral supplement uh, of doTERRA contains 400 micro micrograms in their daily dosage. So if you take four capsules a day, best would be two in the morning, two in the afternoon. And of course you also, if you're eating real foods, whole foods, you are also taking folate into your system each and every day. So this is important as well. As always, don't just rely on your supplements for, you know, good dietary food nutrients. 
my special tip though is because if you've ever saw them i mean those capsules aren't tiny i'm having a hard time swallowing capsules anyway during oh the first 17 to 18 weeks of my pregnancy i felt sick and it was even harder for me to swallow any capsules without gagging and throwing up so my special tip is my personal tip open up the capsules and take them with some juice a smoothie or a yogurt they don't take really they don't taste really great so i wouldn't just mix them with water and drink them but you can open up the capsule it's definitely better if you if you can swallow them directly but it's not a huge deal if you have to open them up and drink it with some liquid it doesn't taste great but i mean it's easier to get into the body so this is super important during pregnancy and you will i actually feel a big difference if i take my supplements or not and you know those days where i felt so sick that there was no way of getting anything into my body be like open up capsules or swallowing it or i forgot the days after that i really felt the difference i felt more tired and especially now that I'm not sick anymore, luckily, but you know, I can tell by my energy levels if I forgot about taking them. The alternative would also be the A to C chewables. Those are for the kids, it's like the kids' vitamins. They also contain folate and um, 100, 100 micrograms per tablet. So if you take four tablets a day, you will receive the folate that's recommended for most pregnant ladies. And interesting thing is um, that they also contain choline, which is a supplement um, that's very important as well for the nervous system. It's important for kids when they grow up, but now there's kind of studies suggesting that taking choline um, during your pregnancy, and I think the choline is actually written C-H-O-L-I-N-E, but choline when you hear it, it's the same thing. Um, it's very important as well during pregnancy for perfect or the optimal, I mean, what's perfect, but the optimal development of the nervous system. Additionally, I would recommend the Terra Greens and Trim Shake. So the Terra Greens, I like to mix with some orange juice as well to, you know, get some fruits and veggies into my body, especially in the first trimester where it was so hard to eat anything, and, you know, not every vegetable seemed very attractive to me. And the trim shake, I actually like to use some plant milk, some coconut milk, whatever, sometimes plain milk if I didn't have anything else in the house. I use a scoop of the trim shake. I really like the wild orange trim shake. I'm not sure if they still have it. They had it for a little while, but it doesn't matter. Vanilla, chocolate with some plant milk, a banana, and then I put the, the capsules of the Microplex VMZ the vitamin and mineral supplement in there. And then I drank it and it was kind of filling as well. Um, it tasted all right to me. So this is my personal recommendation to yeah, have some additional supplements in your body. And probiotics, they're so, so important probiotics. Don't forget, you will give your gut flora to your baby. This is what your baby's like, is, is coming on to, into the world with the gut flora that you are having during pregnancy. Of course, they're the PB Assist Plus, so those are the pre and probiotics for adults, they're little capsules, and the PB Assist Junior, which are super handy, again, if you're having a hard time swallowing. Um, the difference is that the PB Assist Junior contain a little more of probiotic cultures that are important for babies and little children, so it's actually, I personally think it's actually a good idea to switch between the two of them. Both are all right for grown-ups, um, but as I said, there's like a little more kid-specific uh, cultures in the PBS Junior. So I actually think it's a good idea to, even if you can swallow capsules, have them in your daily regimen, at least a few times a week. So. Something against morning sickness. First of all, I found nothing. And I looked at what all other doTERRA risks all over the world did, like that are pregnant right now, have been pregnant in the past. And if any of them had a solution against the feeling of nausea and morning sickness, which again is really all day sickness and all night. Um, 
And there is nothing, and there's nothing that medicine can actually provide us with that really helps. But especially when it comes to this feeling of feeling queasy all the time. But I found that citrus oils especially help me so much with, with just, you know, just getting along with it and not throwing up 24 seven. Sometimes if, I mean, I had one weekend where I was like all over the place and then wild orange was the only thing that gave me oh, such a good feeling. And I mean, I've been such a big fan of wild orange during my whole pregnancy. It's, it helped me with nausea. It helped me with actually calming down as well. It just gives me such a good feeling when I smell it. I love wild orange. And so this is one of the oils that I use the most. Also, I use lemon. I use the sunny citrus, which was part of this um, citrus pack. Like it's a three pack with, I had red, red mandarin, kumquat, and the sunny citrus in there. And the sunny citrus is a blend of citrus oils and some peppermint because peppermint is another oil that's uh, very helpful whenever you're feeling queasy and sick. The slim and sassy, because there's grapefruit, lemon, peppermint, ginger, and cinnamon in there. I didn't really like the cinnamon in it, but the other oils were, you know, just felt good to me. Then ginger itself, um, the mint oils, like the peppermint, the spearmint, although I'm more of a fan of the spearmint usually. The cardamom is always an oil that I like when my stomach feels kind of tight and I want something for my stomach that's not cooling, like citrus oils and mint oils. I want something, I have the feeling I want something that's a little more warming. And the digestin or the Sengest, although those are the oils that I like, the, the digestin or as it's called in Australia and actually even Europe and I think Canada as well, the Sengest. I usually um, use them whenever I feel sick or I have trouble with my stomach during my pregnancy. I actually rather had something else. I think it's because like the anise that's in there and you know, the whole blend of the oil, it's not the most pleasant smelling oil I find. I mean, it works like a charm and I, I always use it a lot, but during my pregnancy, it was the one that I used the least when I felt sick. I'd rather go for the lemon oils or the, the wild orange oil. So listen to your body. It will tell you what will be best for you. As I said, there's no solution against everything, like the whole feeling of it. But to me personally, I didn't throw up each and every day. And I think like huffing all the oils helped me with that. And my personal tip, again, especially in the morning, eat a few bites of something while you're still in bed. I had something called breakfast cookies. And I found them when I was already actually getting a bit better. So I'm not sure if it would help, have helped me in the very beginning. But while still in bed, I had a few bites of those breakfast cookies. And they were kind of, you know, soft cookies um, with some fiber and stuff and some fruits in it. So whatever you think um, tastes good to you. And while still laying in bed, I had a little sip of milk with it in the morning. So this is what I did for a few weeks. And it really helped me. When I got up, my, my blood sugar levels were up already and I felt so much better. So this is a personal tip of mine, additionally. For the relaxation, of course, the lavender. I loved rose, the rose touch roll on. The wild orange again, I mean, there's no way around wild orange for me right now. Serenity, the Douglas fir, I really like the fir oils right now because they're kind of fresh and grounding as well. The holiday piece, which, which contains vetiver, very grounding, and fir oils. And the copaiba, although the copaiba only during pregnancy for me in the blend, because especially in the beginning, I didn't like the smell of it. Now I'm like, hmm, it's all right. It's not super exciting for me, but I like to combine it with all the other oils because I think it actually doesn't even have strong smell when you put it into a blend, but it's very cal calming oil in the diffuser or if you, I, I actually use a lot of oils topically during pregnancy. I have a lot of people who are like, oh, I only diffused oils. I didn't put anything on my body or uh, took internally while I was pregnant. Oh, I did all of it. Seriously. I, I actually the diffusion probably was the one thing that I did the least because usually I always have a diffuser running in my home now while I'm pregnant I mean now it's getting better but your sense of smell really develops it gets so strong and I found that having a bottle under my nose which of course is super strong but just have this for a few minutes helped me 
so much more and I didn't feel like diffusing something for hours. I just took the bottle and sometimes every few minutes and took a whiff and that was fine for me. But the diffuser, I don't know, I just didn't really feel like diffusing. But I love to put it on my skin. I love to mix the lavender uh, in my body lotion before I went to bed or put the lavender touch on my wrist or put the rose touch on my wrist. Um, so I felt really comfortable with it. I even drank some wild orange oil, like had a drop in my water when I didn't feel that well. So I did all of it. So whatever feels comfortable to you is probably right for you. Skincare. If at first I thought I had hormonal breakouts in the first few weeks, so I used the HD Clear series. Sorry, there's another typo. I forgot to um, translate this here, obviously. So, but I used the whole HD Clear program, the washing foam and the oil and the moisturizer to help me with my skin. And it really helped clear up my skin, actually. And now I'm switching all over the places with the different kind of skincare lines from doTERRA. And to prevent stretch marks, I use the replenishing body butter. And I, I, I still have my belly and it's not fully grown yet. So this is what I'm planning on doing. And this is what I told a friend who had a baby a few months ago and it helped her. So I'm hopefully it will help me not develop any stretch marks. Uh, this is what I'm praying for, hoping for. but. I can tell you if it really works for me. Right now, I'm fine. I'm using the replenishing body butter uh, each and every night on my uh, belly and on the breasts and on actually kind of my thighs and my butt cheeks to help them stretch a little bit, which they're doing. And I mix the body lotion with some lavender and frankincense sometimes, or even use the rose hand lotion, which is, I mean, the same, has the same base as the body lotion, just with rose oil. So whatever I like. You can use any oil of choice, but lavender and frankincense are really good for the skin. So, and it's nice to use them, especially before you go to bed because they're calming. But the body butter, oh, I love it. It's such a great product. It's so smooth on the skin. It's all natural. So all of the stuff is all natural. So I don't worry about it, putting it on my body. And don't forget, I mean, we're so crazy about pregnant ladies, but nobody thinks about what they put on their bodies. Like perfumes and makeup and skincare, which of course can be so toxic. So I love our skincare lines. Again, my motto is concentrate on the possibilities instead of the don'ts. Listen to your body. It will tell you right away what's good for you and what's not. Luckily, I mean, some women say during the pregnancy, their sense of smell was so strong, they really had trouble smelling any oil. Not me. I did classes. I had no problem whatsoever with the oils. Yeah, they smelled stronger than usually, but it wasn't uncomfortable to, to me. And I really loved using them so far in my pregnancy. And I'm sure I will, I will continue loving using them during my pregnancy, during the birth experience as well. Uh, for my baby, I have so many people telling me, oh, you're such a lucky person because you have oils right from the get-go. I wish I would have had some oils when my baby was born because this was ha would have helped us so much, I'm sure, because now that the kids are older, they're so happy with it. So yeah, don't fall into all the fear mongering. Of course, quality is important, but that's why we're choosing doTERRA oils and nothing else. That's why we're doing and giving our bodies the best. Try to do your own research, listen to your body. Those are the main points that I can give you today. I hope this was helpful to you. I hope this cleared up a lot of stuff for you. And I'll send you a big, big hug here from Austria and lots of love and talk to you soon. Bye-bye.